next day out of Chicago. Over the course of two days, that's two forums, one today here at UIC and one tomorrow at the University of Chicago. Now these forums are partnership partnership between the WBC, the Chicago Sun Times, and the Chicago Institute of Politics. We are here with a live audience, and you can listen to us at 91.5 FM, or the WBC and you, and you can watch, watch us as we stream live on both WBCs and the Chicago Sun Times YouTube pages. Now, we want to thank the candidates who are here with us today and seated in the order that they will appear on the ballot. We've got Chicago Alderman Women, Sophie King, Illinois State Rep. Cam Buckner, former CBS CEO Paul Ballas, Chicago Mayor Roy Lightfoot, and Congressman Michigan Garcia. The rules of the forum today are simple. So, unlike a formal debate, there are no opening or closing remarks. And, and answers, answers are not strictly timed. However, this being just a one hour forum, I would like to keep things moving at times. And if and a candidate criticizes another candidate, candidate that, that person will be given a chance to respond. Now, the, now the questions, questions that we are asking today, they have been informed by WBEZ's People's Agenda Survey. We got nearly 2,000 responses, which Chicago is telling us what issues matter to them and what questions they have for the next year. Some questions will go to all candidates, and some will be directed to individuals. All right, let's get started. So candidates from our People's Agenda Survey, we learned that crime is the top issue for most respondents. It's been a major talking point so far this election season. So I want to start with a comment from the public. Here is Levi and Edgewater. How do you plan to address crime in the short term? Short term, your first six months of the Definitely not, not the investment in addressing the long term issues that may take years from the village. People want to be they'll say next month this is reasonable. So the first six months in office, what's your plan? So we will go down the line in order here, starting with you, Alderwoman King. First six months in office, what is your plan? Yeah, so, so crime is the number one, two, and three issue on people's agenda. Um, and we have a plan, 10 point plan, 18 pages that gets to the plan, that gets to crime right away. So we have a plan that puts more officers in all communities immediately. The mayor should be implementing this plan today. Um, it, by just changing the shifts, we can put up to 50% more officers in all communities. We also have a plan that gets to violence intervention, which is again a failure of this uh, administration. We gave her $85 million to spend on violence intervention and not even $5 million is out the door in 2022. So we also know that over 50% of calls to 911 are for nonviolent issues. So we have to have alternative responses there for homeless insecurities, um, uh, mental health insecurities. And so we need to do those things. We need to have more officers in all of our communities immediately. We need to spend money on violence intervention and we need to have alternative responses to uh, 911. Those are some of the things as mayor that I would implement immediately. Representative Buckner. Yeah, listen, there are a few things I think we gotta do uh, out the gate. Uh, one, it starts with CPD leadership. We have to have the right person uh, in the superintendent role to be able to bring forth the changes uh, that we need. I've talked a lot about redrawing the police districts. Uh, to me, that's not a novel idea. The reason that it's important is because every 10 years, we redraw our congressional maps and our uh, automatic maps because demographics shift and change. Um, we're right now operating off of, off of 1970 district maps. Um, when we talk about resources and making sure they're allocated properly, we gotta make sure that we put people where they belong based on the way we draw these lines for the current Chicago that we live in. I'll do that immediately. I'm also talking about uh, instituting a group violence reduction strategy. We're talking a lot about, quote unquote, uh, folks who are, are uh, murderers, but we're not talking to them and people who are living in these communities about what they need to feel safe and how we uh, stem the tide. So I'll do that on day one. I'll also say that I, um, I'll commit uh, to making sure that we have a, a mental health apparatus that is in place to deal with our young people. Um, because what we see is that people who are being stuck in the cycle of violence are getting younger and younger, 13 and 14 year old children. The city has to lead and coordinate the effort between um, government, uh, nonprofit organizations, uh, community-based groups, faith-based groups, and even the street organizations who have been a part of this as well. Paul Vallis. Well, great. Well, first of all, we've got to replace the leadership team and we've got to move towards a promotion policy, which it's, it really abandons the friends and family, and that just not only begins with the 
superintendent, but it goes down among the exempt ranks. Secondly, we've got to return to a strategy of community-based policing where you have police officers covering every beat. I think Wire Points came out with a report last year that said 400,000 high priority 911 calls were not responded to. They did not have a car available at the time, including 32,000 assaults in, in progress. Third, there is no witness or victims protection program. I mean, how many beds are out there for domestic shelters for those women who have been abused? What, 150 beds? There's more than 150 calls, more than 150 calls a day. And there are, I just read where there are 70,000 outstanding warrants. Outstanding warrants, it's simply because there's an absence of coordination between the police department and for that matter the county when it comes to identifying and pursuing those people. Uh, we need to embrace violence reduction strategies like CRED and we need to open our school campuses. We need to open our school campuses through the dinner hour, over the summer, on the weekends, uh, and in fact, uh, during holidays and bring community-based organizations onto those campuses so we can keep the kids safe and secure. And the final thing we need to do is we need to take advantage of the programs that are, are already out there for returning citizens. There is really not a comprehensive strategy for addressing the issue of individuals who are returning from incarceration. There are some wards in this city where half the men are in some phase of the criminal justice system and those issues have to be addressed. Mayor Lightfoot. <laughs> Well, the, the question was, what do you do in the short term? What do you do in the long term? Um, in the short term, what is the most immediate threat that we have in our city that keeps us unsafe? That's a number of illegal guns that pour over the border from states like Indiana, uh, from Wisconsin, um, and other places. We will continue the work that we've been doing with our federal partners to make sure that we're bringing those gun trafficking cases. We will make sure that we uh, press that when we arrest folks, that they're held accountable. Um, we, what we saw last year was CPD broke another record in taking 12,200 illegal guns off the streets. We know, unfortunately, that that's probably the tip of the iceberg. We will continue to bring aggressively lawsuits against gun dealers and gun manufacturers um, who don't care about our safety and are selling guns to straw purchasers that end up um, in, as illegal street um, guns um, on our streets. Uh, we have uh, patrols now on the Skyway to send a very clear message that you will not bring illegal guns into the city of Chicago. There are more things that we um, need to do there. But I also want to talk about the long term, which was the second part of the question. The biggest threat that we have there in the long term is a pipeline of young black and brown boys to the streets. When kids are growing up in neighborhoods, they don't see people that go to work every day, they don't see jobs and opportunity, then they take advantage of what's there. And unfortunately, in too many neighborhoods across our city still, what we have is an illegal economy that is dangerous and is violent. So that's why, for example, we've made sure that we bring economic development to neighborhoods on the south and the west side to the tune of now <clears throat> almost $3 billion when you include Invest Southwest and our recovery grants, to do things like build um, affordable housing, make sure that mental health is in every neighborhood as it is now. All of our 77 neighborhoods have culturally relevant, free mental health services, and for the first time in our city's history, we're serving children and adolescents. We've increased the amount of funding for mental health sevenfold over my tenure, more work to be done there. The other thing that we have to do is make sure that we do, and we do fund street outreach. When I came into office, we were funding it at about $2 million a year, and apparently existing members of the city council thought that was okay. I did not. We increased that budget. We're now spending $58 million a year, and the money is flowing to those street outreach. We've got to use right, hard I have and to keep soft it moving. power. Okay, Congressman Garcia, let's focus on the short term here. First six months in office, what's your plan? Uh, good morning. Great to be uh, back at UIC, my alma mater twice, and uh, putting on the headphones because I used to be a DJ in this room, the old Illinois room, so I feel right at home. Uh, but talking about the most serious issue facing Chicagoans today, here's what I would do. One, I would get rid of the present superintendent and name a new superintendent who's familiar with Chicago, preferably Chicago-born and Raise. Two, I would convene a summit uh, with community partners all over Chicagoland, people who are developing community development plans to figure out how we accelerate their implementation. They've already drawn these plans out. They're all over the south, southwest, and northwest sides of the city of Chicago. Very important. Three, I would fully staff the mayor's office of public safety, including the division related to violence prevention programs. 
Violence prevention investments are critical to the well-being of communities. They do God's work. They save lives day in, day out. How do I know? I created one of them, the Little Village Violence Prevention Collaborative, working with people on the south side, southwest side, northwest side, other places in the city of Chicago, critical to the well-being of Chicago. They can prevent many of the incidents that we see there. Lastly, I would convene a summit with other stakeholders to initiate a youth jobs program, like the $10 billion proposal that I proposed in Congress and will be proposing it again. Other cities could benefit from this tremendously. Lastly, I would accelerate the implementation of the consent decree. It's the critical piece to modernizing the police department, to make it accountable, to ensure community and constitutional policing, and to make sure that we get the type of police force that's representative of Chicago and where real trust is being built between community residents and police officers in Chicago. All right, next question. When we talk about crime in this city, we are not just talking about homicides. So Herstina on the north side told us this. Uh, she said, the number of robberies, shots fired through neighbors' windows, walls tagged, break-ins, etc., they have increased in my neighborhood while the number of visible cops has decreased. Safety is a major concern and the only issue I will vote on. How will you fix crime in my neighborhood? Not just homicides, but specifically robberies and break-ins. So Harristina is talking about robberies, carjackings, break-ins, which we know are harder for police to prevent because you have to be on the scene. So what is your plan to stop this? Again, we'll go down the line. Alderwoman King, you first. I'm gonna go first every time. Okay, Absolutely. that's okay. That's the name of the game. Um, so, as I said, we have a plan that puts more police in the communities, in all of our communities, but especially where they're needed, um, day one. You can do that by having a 40-hour work week still, four days on, three days off, up to 50% more officers are there during times that are good so they can mitigate bad times. That's day one. Um, we also have a plan to bring back 1,000 reserve officers. New York City does it. They have 4,000 officers uh, that are reserve officers. We can put those officers uh, in the detective division so that they can solve crimes. You know, our clearance rate is one of the lowest in the country. We definitely need to solve crimes. Uh, um, violent crimes are up 30% under this administration. Arrests are down 75%. We need to make sure that we both uplift our police and hold them accountable. We know that we can do both. Violence intervention is also a strong part of this. We have to get to the root causes. Again, we have a plan that gets to that as well. We have a plan that incentivizes young people to come off the street into the legal economy by giving them job training, trauma-informed care, uh, mental health uh, support, wraparound services for their community, excuse me, for their family, and it brings the whole entire community in, the clergy, uh, the, the safety um, uh, police, and everybody in to support that individual. And it's a, a direct uh, form of intervention that's been done in other cities. We need to do that here. We, we failed in that uh, area. If violence and gun violence is a number one issue in our city, why didn't we get that money in 2022 out the door? That's a failure. We have to prioritize this. We also have to put money into disengaged uh, youth. Uh, so in our education plan, we make sure that we bring trades back to the schools in a very meaningful way. There's no reason why we wait until kids are 18 years old to expose them to jobs livable wages and train them for the jobs of the future. We need to do that in seventh, I mean in, in 11th and 12th grade. We also need to make sure we have after school programs between K through 12. Uh, that's when our youth are disengaged too. I would make sure that that's mandatory, right, that kids have a strong co-curricular program, after school programming. That's truly important. All right, let's move on Thank to you. Representative Buckner. So this is part of the reason that we've got to uh, do the work around our actual maps, the district maps, because this is how we resource our communities uh, and put um, officers uh, where they need to go. Currently, it's not working, and what we've done uh, as a stopgap gap measure is we created these citywide units where they're flowing from community to community, but they don't get to know communities. They don't have um, any real understanding of what's happening in communities, and so therefore, they've not been able to stop these crimes. Uh, 
so that's the first thing we've got to do once again. Num number two, uh, we have to focus on our abysmal clearance rate. We talk a lot about the clearance rate in terms of uh, homicides, uh, but the clearance rate for carjacking, for sexual assault, for burglary, for robberies are equally uh, as, as horrible. Actually, they're, they're worse. I think our carjacking clearance rate is somewhere in the low uh, double digits, right, 13 14%. And so what that tells me is that people continue People do these uh, crimes and continue to do them because they're not getting caught. They're not um, get meeting justice at, at all. And so um, we've got to make sure we put more uh, detectives in the ranks to, call, to, to close these crimes out, um, make sure that there's real coordination between the city, um, the state's attorney, the chief judge, and the, um, and the sheriff. Our, our leaders are so busy fighting each other, they're not fighting for us. And that's why our communities have been less than safe. But the, the last thing I'll say, is that we know a lot of these uh, people who are committing these type of crimes are young people. Uh, the, uh, the American juvenile justice system was created right here on this campus, right, just a few uh, feet from where we stand. We gotta make sure that we can go back and figure out what we're doing wrong when it comes to our young people, both from a uh, school standpoint, a training standpoint, but also what do we do when young people do become a part of the, of, of the system? How do we make sure they don't recidivize and, uh, and become part of the, the, prison, the school to prison pipeline? Paul Vallis? Yeah, you know, let me again return to this issue of community policing. And again, this is a wire points analysis that talked about half the high priority 911 calls not being responded to. When you don't have beat cars, you don't have those immediate responses. When you're waiting one or two hours, you're simply not going to be able to improve the clearance rates. And let me point out that you can go to the police database or you can look at the stories that have been done by the Sun Times. Uh, the clearance rates are, I mean, even the clearance rates on murders, they talk about record clearance rates, but they point out that only half of those cases cleared is actually running, uh, resulting in an arrest. So while they're taking that uh, incident off the book, only half the times are they actually making an arrest in those murders. But you're correct when you talk about 5% clearance rates in shootings. You've got to, and I agree with, uh, I agree with uh, uh, Alderman King, You've got to um, uh, bring retired police officers back, and you've got to swell the detective ranks with analysts who can work these cases, because we have one-sixth the number of detectives New York has, and on a per capita basis, it's one-third. Uh, they only have about 200 all, uh, uh, detectives, as sometimes again reported, uh, actually focusing on murders in Chicago. You also need to create a witness protection program. Two years, there were 58 mass shootings in Chicago, led the nation in mass shootings, through August of that year, they had made one arrest. Last year, there were 47 mass shootings. I, I, I think they've made a handful of arrests. People are afraid to come forward. That is why they cannot clear cases. And then finally, on the, you, know, you can collect all the guns you want, but if you're not ma making arrests, you're not accomplishing anything. The police will tell you that the lack of a forensic lag, the lack of the city having its own uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, forensic lab, the inability to trace the guns, to track the guns, the inability to get the DNA information back impedes their ability to close these cases. So, you know, you confiscate the guns and they go out and get more guns. I mean, that is a fact. Talk to any police officer when you walk out the door and they will tell you exactly that. All right, we so gotta these move are on. things that you can do. Mayor. Well, Mr. Vallis, I, I know you've been gone from the city of Chicago for a long time, but almost everything that you just said is categorically untrue and probably because you're getting your public safety advice from John Cantazara, who you hosted a fundraiser for just two days ago. Let me, let me actually you bring you up to speed on what the facts are. The fact of the matter is our clearance rate is about 50%. That's increased, increased markedly <clears throat> over my time in office from when it was <clears throat> in the teens. Um, the fact of the matter is we do have more police. We hired 956 police last year. We promoted um, for, to the detective ranks, ranks over 300 officers in the last two years. So I can't sit here and listen to you denigrate our hardworking men and women of the police department. And when they, make, when they take those guns off the street, they are making arrests. This is dangerous, violent work that requires them to put themselves at risk every single day. Easy for you to say from your perspective, but I deal with the police every single day and I know what they're, do they're doing. You say that there's no witness protection program. This is the first administration in the history of the city that actually has full-time 
uh, witness coordinators, we put money into it, we're working with them, and frankly, we're not making the victims wait until they get reimbursed a year or two later from the state. We are giving them monies now so they can bury their loved ones, so they can deal with the financial consequences of what's happened. You need to actually get yourself up to date on the facts about what's happening in this city. You talk about youth invest investments, and you said repeatedly we ought to open up the schools. Well, let me just tell you, 93% of our elementary schools and a huge percentage of our high schools are open every single day for after school programs. And we put our money where our mouth is. It's one of our signature investments in our young people. The uh, million, a hundred million dollars that we put into young people for jobs, for after school activities, making sure that we're connecting them with the parks, the libraries. These are things that are happening right now. Okay, Again, we'll I know you moving. don't know that, but these are all the things that go in to help our young people stop that pipeline to the streets and make our community safer. You, you should mayor. know that if you want to be the mayor of Chicago. Paul Vallis, I'm going to give you just 20 seconds to respond. We do have to keep it moving. Yeah, you know, I'm going to decline to respond other than to say that coming from a family of six veterans and four police officers, when police officers have retirement luncheons, I attend those luncheons since I've attended those luncheons, I think for the last 10 years. So at the end of the day, you know, I, I just submit my case. The data that I've articulated comes directly from the Inspector General's reports and comes directly from the police department itself. So okay. all the data I put out is factual. All right, Congressman Garcia, the, the question was, your plan to stop robberies, carjackings, break-ins? Yes. Uh, first of all, you're hearing a lot of plans, uh, and some of them are really good plans. But what is critical with plans is whether a leader has the wherewithal to bring people together to get stuff done. On crime, this is especially important. What I would do is I would convene the state's attorney, I would convene the chief judge, I would convene the juvenile judge, and other stakeholders who play a critical role in collaborating as they should. That hasn't been done, why not? Specifically, I would also do the following as it relates to public safety and the police department. I would get rid of the citywide units and make people come back to the neighborhoods to patrol, to walk the beat, to talk to neighbors. Building trust is essential for greater public safety in Chicago because people have lost that trust. And those citywide units have turned out not to be effective. Ask the people in Atlanta, ask police leaders in Memphis as well where they recently did that. Two, it's important that we do crisis response teams. That means hiring more civilians so that officers are not responding to incidents or situations pertaining to domestic violence, mental health, or some hate incidents or hate crimes against the LGBTQ community, Muslims, Jews, and other groups that are targeted. Very, very important. And lastly, those same teams can respond to traffic complaints. There are 911 traffic complaints as well as other calls that don't require a uniformed officer, we have to prioritize solving violent crime and preventing crime. That's Thank how you, you get a good start. This is Reset, I'm Sasha Ann Simons, and this is the first of two mayoral forums here on the show. Today we're talking to five of the candidates, and tomorrow we will talk with the other four about some of the biggest issues in this campaign, including how the candidates plan to tackle crime. Now these forums, they're brought to you by WBEZ, the Chicago Sun-Times, and the University of Chicago's Institute of Politics, and our host today, the University of Illinois, Chicago. Today's set of candidates include Mayor Lori Lightfoot, former CPS CEO Paul Vallis, Congressman Chewy Garcia, Alderwoman Sophia King, and State Representative Cam Buckner. A reminder, I wanna get as many Chicagoans' questions in as possible this hour. So I wanna turn now from crime to transportation with you. Uh, this was mentioned in nearly one third of responses that we got in our People's Agenda survey. Commuters on public transit, they say that they've seen an increase in wait times, they've seen an increase in crime. The Chicago Transit Authority says there's just not enough CTA staff. Claire from Uptown asks, how can you make citizens confident of their safety on the CTA? Your thoughts, Alderwoman King? Dare I go to you first? <laughs> An equitable way it's, would it's be It's been to, a while. That's, that's how we've been doing it, where everybody gets to start. But I'll go. It, it's not a big, big deal. You, you know, safety on, until we get safety on our, 
our public transportation systems, people aren't going to come back, and ridership is down. And unless we get ridership up, we're not going to have enough money to fund our system. So we need to take the uh, dollars that we're spending on private security to pull that back to officers. I would suggest the, the retired officers that we're suggesting to come back and, and serve in that particular role. But in order to really be a world-class transportation system, we have to take a regional approach. If we don't take a regional approach, we won't uh, use economies of scale to put those resources into our system. For instance, the federal government sees the CTA, Metra, and RTA as competitors. $29 million was given to the CTA to electrify their buses. But in Boston, over $120 million was given to them. In New York, over $150 million, I think, was given to them because they're a regional transportation system. So we're competing for resources that we don't have to do. So we have to bring, uh, uh, we have to collaborate with uh, the, the um, county, with the state, in order to have a world-class transportation system. That's something that I would Thank do you, as mayor. Maybe you can let me go again, since I always go first. I'll flip the order for <laughs> okay. you. Okay, I got Appreciate you. Appreciate it. Representative Buckner. Yeah, listen, I, 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 um, I'm a regular CTA rider. I actually planned on riding the bus here today, but I got ghosted. Um, thank God I had a, a second option, which we'll a lot talk of about Chicagoans that as well. don't. Um, but, but listen, uh, when it comes to where this uh, system is right now, we are falling way behind the mark, and it's because we haven't done the planning, uh, and there has been no leadership in CTA. In fact, uh, the mayor gets to appoint the chair of CTA, and she left that, that chair unappointed for nearly two years. Uh, and we're seeing right now the ramifications of that. Listen, um, as far as safety is concerned, uh, we do have to do something about what's going on on CTA. Um, I think one thing I've called for is making sure that we can connect the 32,000 cameras on the system to the central security system, which right now they're not connected to it. Uh, number two, we need to bring back CTA transit ambassadors uh, to um, de-escalate nonviolent situations and, and provide us with eyes and ears. And thirdly, uh, we need to bring back a, or we need to create a text system where people who are on the trains and buses can text to a number um, contemporaneously and say what's going on uh, and then get some help. We, we always tell folks who ride transit, if you see something, say something, but say something to who? There is no one to say something to, right? And so we have to change that. We've spent $100 million recently on uh, this fake security apparatus where it's $70 million for uh, security guards um, and $30 million on German shepherds. And nobody on the system feels safer than they did, you know, a few years ago. And so we've got to do the work. I think there's, we can look at places who have done this right, places like Boston. I think Boston has the great privilege of having a, a mayor who was born in Chicago. I think that's a good thing for most folks to have. And uh, that actually, has, they, have, they have a system that's moved, been able to move forward in All a right. rapid way. We should do the same thing. Let's hear from Paul Vallis. Well, you know, I agree with what, uh, much of what Cam and uh, Alderman King said. Let me point out, though, again, let me quote the Sun-Times, um, NWBZ. Um, the Sun-Times came out with a story that said the fare box share of CT operating budgets is down to 18%, which means when COVID runs out, the CTA could be facing bankruptcy, 18%. That's their, that's not, I didn't get that from John Catanzaro, by the way. Secondly, <laughs> secondly, secondly, the uh, WBZ did a survey that basically said that 50% of those who ride the CTA feel that the CTA is unsafe. Uh, I mean, that's a, that's a catastrophe. That is the reason why CTA ridership is down 500,000 a day. That is why the CTA will be on the verge of bankruptcy when the COVID money runs out. Obviously, uh, CTA service is a big part of it, but CTA service is, in, is being impeded by the fact that in addition to losing riders because they feel the CTA is unsafe, they are losing employees, they are exiting as fast as the police officers are exiting, and they are having difficulty recruiting people to fill those ranks. So what you have to do is you have to have first order business is to take that $100 million that you're spending and privatize CTA security. And for $100 million, you can actually hire another 300 police officers to supplement the police officers that are there so that you can ensure that riding the CTA is as safe as going to the airport. Mayor. Well, again, um, the CTA has to be safe, period, full stop. 
It is the lifeline for people in the city, particularly working families um, and working individuals that have to get from one place to another, which is precisely why we've pr prioritized doing a number of things. We've made progress, and crime on the CTA is down. We're not at the finish line by any stretch of the imagination, but we've made significant progress. Uh, why have we made progress? We made progress because we listened first and foremost to the CTA workers themselves those bus operators, those train operators, and ask them, what are you seeing? What do we need to be doing better? And what they universally told us is, we need more uniform police officers on the trains and on the buses, and that's precisely what we've done. We've made sure that we've given more full-time police officers in uniform to the train, to the trains and to the buses. That's helped enormously. Why else have we uh, made progress? Because the CTA has also increased the number of non-law um, enforcement officers that are on the trains, on the platforms, and in the trains. And we're making sure that we hold them accountable, that they're doing their work through making sure that they've all got GPS devices so the supervisors can track where they are on a regular basis. We've also made progress because we've listened to the customers. And, and with due respect, to, again, to Mr. Vallis, part of the reason that the CTA ridership is down is because it's a thing called the pandemic and because people are not coming downtown full-time like they used to. They're in remote learning, uh, remote uh, uh, work. And so er overall, that's affecting not only the CTA ridership, but other parts of our economy. All right, let's hear from economy. the congressman on this. If, if I can just... Thank you. Another uh, five couple of seconds. seconds. Go as, ahead, Congressman. As a, a founder of the Futures of Transportation in the United States Congress, the newest caucus there, transportation has been my top issue in Washington, and we delivered for Chicago, we delivered for Metro, and the CTA, and PACE. Nevertheless, ridership levels are down. We need to figure out how to get them up. I'll come back to that. But if you want to be an effective leader, you have to be a good listener, and you have to be a collaborator. That's what I am prepared to do as mayor. With respect to the issue at hand, the money will be drying up. We're going to have to reimagine transit and its role, and that requires working across agencies, very important. But at the same time, I am deeply disappointed and pissed off that buses are dirty, that trains are filthy, people doing all kinds of things that didn't happen just a few years ago. I've heard it time and time again. As someone who's worn out a lot of CTA bus cards, I tell you, this is important to me. I will convene the agent, the, the, the transit agency leadership to let them know that business as usual can't be afforded. If Chicago is to once again become a world-class city, it needs a top-rated transit system. I intend on making that reality, and I have the relationships in Washington and in Springfield to ensure that we figure out a way forward, but good transit on time, clean and safe is critical. Having more conductors and operators and maintenance personnel will help, along with the added cops once we do away with the citywide units, because they tend to Thank go you, rogue and do bad things in Chicago. Thank you. All right, so we're going to mix it up now, still sticking with transportation. Uh, many who took part in our People's Agenda survey, they wanted to know how the next mayor hopes to tackle safety, including bike safety. Here is Mary in Ukrainian Village. Car-dominated transportation is a key contributor of greenhouse gas emissions and a major source for preventable injuries and deaths in Chicago. At the same time, because of Chicago's density and grid, there's a lot of potential for greener forms of transportation, like walking, biking, or public transit. What will you do to make it more convenient, faster, and safer for non-drivers to get around Chicago? Mayor Lightfoot. We have um, done a number of things, uh, particularly around alternative forms of public transportation. We put in literally hundreds of new miles of bike lanes all across the city. What we're doing now, and we started this last summer, and we'll um, continue to do this over the course of this next year, is make sure that all those bike lanes are actually protected by concrete barriers. We have increased uh, pedestrian islands and other safety uh, measures across our streets, using data to see where we're seeing the biggest amount of problems with pedestrian accidents and safety issues, and then using that data to make sure uh, that we are creating those pedestrian islands, making sure that the timing on the lights um, are, are better than what they've been before. We've also uh, accelerated the amount of alternative forms 
of public transportation, scooters, uh, electric bikes, and other things like that. Again, using data and bringing those to areas of the city that they haven't been before, like the south side uh, and the west side. We've also fought against in, uh, opportunities for people to increase the amount of speeds around parks and schools. This is a nationwide problem where we're seeing people driving simply way too fast on our streets. We're being much more aggressive at making sure uh, that we're holding people accountable, lowering the speeds, and we're talking now with transportation experts and members of the city council about lowering overall speeds across the city even more to get people to slow down. Last thing is, I've spent a number of times talking to Secretary Buttigieg of the Department of Transportation to work with the car manufacturers to build cars that are actually safer because right now the, the the focus of the research has been on making the passengers and the drivers safe in the cars but not thinking about the pedestrians outside of the car if you get hit by today's cars at 40 miles an hour you have virtually no chance of survival that's something that the federal government should be taking on to make sure that our streets are safer same question to you, Congressman Garcia. What will you do to make it more convenient, faster, and safer for non-drivers to get around the city? Well, being the uh, leading voice in Congress on uh, transit and, of course, uh, doing away with the old funding formula of highways, get 80% of the funds and the rest go uh, to other forms of transit, that's got to change. So one, I would do everything possible to help people and educate and prepare people to move away from car dependency. Two, and I quote from my transportation plan, I will co-author and shepherd legislation to ensure that complete streets, bike pedestrian infrastructure to help Chicago achieve its vision zero goal of zero pedestrian vehicle fatalities. I've been a leader on that in Congress. I will promote transportation infrastructure to expand bus and bicycle lanes, including creating a protected bike grid. Now, this entails that we take a leadership role in creating more BRT routes across Chicago. If we're going to incentivize people to divorce their cars, and they should because they're too expensive and they break families up, then we've got to provide them with a world-class system of public transit. All right. Access to the CTA came up in dozens of survey responses. Jane on Twitter wants to know from you, how will you address disparities in access to transit that negatively impact vast swaths of the far south and east sides of the city? Representative Buckner. Well, listen, it's, it's painful that it's 2023 and we're talking about a system uh, in a world-class city like Chicago that is still not 100% accessible. Uh, it is problematic that we have not done the work in order to move us closer to that goal, and we have to. Uh, we've seen new stations built. We've seen uh, stations renovated and platforms redone uh, without accessibility being the, 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 uh, the thing that uh, we strive for, right? So we got to do better than, than that. Uh, what I've called for in my plan is that every time that uh, we redo a streetscape, every time we... Uh, at a bike lane or any kind of work that we're going to do from an infrastructure level, there will be a safety and accessibility score that comes through CDOT before we dig into the ground. We've got to make this a more accessible city, and the CTA will be 100% accessible under a Buckner administration. Uh, what also is true is that we know in many of the transit deserts on the south side and the west side, uh, people are not able uh, to maneuver our streets. So we got to do a better job of that. I've talked about a municipal snowplow program, obviously, but there's also more work we got to do to maintain that integrity. And then lastly, we've got a lot of people in Chicago who are low vision or have um, vision issues. The technology that we need to put forth to make sure that they can have the ability to actually walk across the street and to move across the street is not very expensive. If we can find a way to put shot spotter all around our communities, we can do the same thing when it comes to making sure that we are accessible and driving this forward so Chicago can, can be a truly equitable city. Alderwoman King, let's hear your uh, your plan for access uh, disparities in access to transit. Yeah, so uh, disparities in access impact mostly black and brown communities and disproportionately um, uh, impact disabled folks. Listen, in, in my ward in Bronzeville, they tried to shut down, you know, three bus lines, <laughs> and one on Sundays uh, for uh, that mostly my uh, seniors or elderly community 
uh, were taking uh, to get to church. And we fought to preserve uh, that access. So we have to look at real equity in the city and not just talk about it. And redistributing wealth in, in terms of uh, public transit is something that we need to look at. But again, in order to do that, we have to have a regional approach to transportation so that we can have more resources to do that. I do want to go back to the bike safety because I had some ideas around that. Um, lowering speeds in all communities is something that I would do. Uh, 30 miles per hour in neighborhoods is just uh, too fast. I would also uh, institute what New York does. Um, no turn on reds, especially downtown. A lot of accidents happen to pedestrians and to uh, cyclists, uh, when people are turning on red, there's no reason that we shouldn't be able to institute like that. I would continue protected bike lanes. And the last thing I would want to say is that, you know, I appreciate that Paul agrees with a lot of what I'm saying, but Paul and I are two totally different candidates. Um, you know, he believes in law and order. There are candidates that believe in defund the police. I'm right where people stand that we can uplift our police, hold them accountable, we can have safety and justice, and I'm not waffling on a woman's right to control her body like Paul has done. Women, you have to listen to this. We do not want to be back where we All are right, now let's, let's fighting against Roe v. Wade right now. Paul Vallis, <clears throat> since we're on your name here, I've got a different transportation question for yeah, you. Absolutely. Uh, this one is from Tim Shambrook. You may remember him as, as the father of the three-year-old girl who died last year uh, while riding on her mother's bike in a bike lane that was blocked by a ComEd truck. He took our survey, and here's his question. What will you do to address the continued lack of commitment by CDOT and IDOT and elected leaders in creating a citywide bike network with real safety concerns addressed? Also, uh, can we please get laws on the books that will allow for more severe punishment than a simple ticket if you kill a cyclist? Your response. You know, let me respond by saying that, uh, I think one of my strengths has always been knowing what I don't know and going to the people who know what I need to know and then confiding and embracing them. The bottom line is there is a tremendous advocacy community that's been talking about this for years. The question is, are we going to embrace their recommendations and implement it? I attended the transit conference where the discussion centered around bike lanes and bike safety and accessibility. I mean, there's been plans on the books, there's been maps laid out, there's been routes, there's been recommendations. What I'll do is I'll implement it, as simple as that. You know, when I was budget director, I resurfaced 70 percent of the city streets in three years. Uh, we built police stations all over the city. We did it by responding, by acting. So the bottom line is there is, there are comprehensive plans out there that the advocates have been advocating for and pushing for so many years. Do it. Make a commitment to it. So those are things that I would need to do, and those are things that I would prioritize. Mayor. Well, um, the, the first question I want to go back to, which is disparities in transit, and probably one of the most disconnected areas of our city is the far south side. That's why we are bringing the red line extension to the far south side all the way to 130th Street. This has been talked about since the time of Richard J. Daly. We are actually getting it done. And not only will it connect those areas all the way down to our garden and Roseland and other stops, to transit, but it's also going to bring tremendous economic development to every one of the areas around those stops. This is historic. It's a big deal. We're working with the U.S. Department of Transportation. We've been lobbying them for the last two years, and we're actually um, going to get it done. Um, the other things that I wanted to talk about regarding alternative uh, forms of transportation is um, our trail system. We have put together, I think, one of the most comprehensive systems to link trails off-road from the south side to the north side and back in between. We actually just got a significant grant from the Department of Transportation to launch the Inglewood Trail. Again, a plan that's been talked about for many, many years. We are actually going to get it done. So those are some of the things that we've been doing, working with community, making sure that we're being responsive to their needs, and then putting our own skin in the game, and then going after those federal dollars to make that possible. The other thing I'll say is ETOD, Equitable Transit Oriented Development, we are getting this done. There are developments that are happening all across our city along transit lines to, again, cut down on the need for cars, make sure that there's affordable um, you, uh, units and family units in those housing. Those are some of the other things that we are right, doing I right I've got to move on to our next topic, which is education. 
um, candidates, education and population loss, they were also top of mind for re respondents of our People's Agenda Survey, so I, I want to talk a bit about your plans to boost enrollment. Alderwoman King, in, in previous forums, you've said the solution to more enrollment in CPS is more housing in neighborhoods. Uh, Representative Buckner, you have pushed for a moratorium on school closures at the state level to give under-enrolled schools longer to figure out what supports are needed. Uh, Paul Vallis, you've said that you would be willing to close under-enrolled schools and that you would use closed schools for job training programs or alternative and charter schools. Mayor Lightfoot, you have said that Invest Southwest and your affordable housing program will stem the tide of population loss. And Representative Garcia, you've said that you will do everything you can to reach students who have fallen through the cracks. So over to you, Congressman Garcia. Why is your plan the right plan for boosting enrollment? I'll give you each about a minute to answer this same question. Thank you. I was uh, very eager to chime in on the uh, previous conversation about transportation. All the things that the mayor said were made possible because Congress delivered. And as the senior transportation and infrastructure guy in the city, I say, you're welcome. Uh, on education, I just want to say the following. With, um, with five grandchildren in the system and uh, three kids who attended Chicago uh, public schools, I understand schools. I helped build them in Little Village, elementary schools, a high school as well. One that we had to fight Paul Vallis because he stole our money and he sent the money to other schools downtown. And that was in 2001. It took a hunger strike to build that school. Having said that, we need to turn over every stone possible to find as many children that fell through the cracks during the pandemic. I fear that they're out there, and I fear that they're living in dangerous situations. We've got to get them back to school. Two, all schools should be adequately resourced. And my relationships in Springfield will be used to ensure that we double the funding formula to Chicago Public Schools. It's critical to making that happen. The State General Assembly over many decades has burdened Chicago with property taxes to fund schools, other essential services. We need to move away from that because it is regressive. It, it, we just can't, it is not sustainable and it's driving people and making people flee neighborhoods that they grew up in, lived for a long, long time. And Congressman, very, very important. You, you talk about finding students that fell through the cracks. How do you do that? How would you do you that? You work with community organizations, starting with block clubs, with churches, with nonprofit organizations. We have some of the best in the city of Chicago. You'd make a call of urgency to find all of these children because many of them may have gotten involved in a lot of the things that today concern us, including carjackings and robberies and other crime that's going on in our communities. There's a reason for it. It's the historic patterns of disinvestment and segregation in Chicago. Thank you. Paul Vallis, why is your plan the right plan to boost enrollment? Well, in part because uh, during my tenure at the Chicago Public Schools, we boosted enrollment by 40,000, and there were 125,000 more children in the school system then than when I departed. And let me point out that I actually funded the Little Village High School. What the account, what the, what the, what the, what the, what the legend. Arnie Duncan funded the Little Village High School, and that's why he was invited to the groundbreaking and the ribbon cutting. Is this my time? Thank you, Congressman. Go Thank ahead, Thank you very Mr. much. Ballard. Besides building 30 schools and 48 additions, we funded the Little Village High School. The problem with the, what, what, what the, what the Congressman doesn't tell you is he got into a fight with the Daly administration over the location of the school, so that delayed the opening of the school. So, but let me get back to my topic. Secondly, let me get back to my to topic, please. I would open school campuses. I would open school campuses through the dinner hour over the weekends, as I've articulated, to, to make all schools community schools. That's what we did during our tenure, during Gary Chico and my tenure. The second thing that I would do is I would expand the alternative schools network. So you reopen these closed schools, or you take a school like Manly that has 67 kids and 27 faculty, and it's built for 1,200, and you have a, 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 a potential alternative school population of 30 or 40,000 young adults, 18 to 25, and the state actually provides funding for these alternative schools. And finally, and this is really important, Real quick. I would open these, these closed schools to charter schools. Charter schools are public schools. 96% of the kids who go to charter schools are black and Latino, and the district bars them from occupying public buildings. So 86 of those schools are actually in substandard buildings. That would be a way 
of reopening all the campuses and filling those campuses and expanding quality of school choices. Representative Buckner. So my, uh, my 14 month old son is now learning causation, right? If, if he turns the cup over, the juice spills out, causation, and then mommy gets mad, causation. Uh, we got to come back to causation. The reason that CPS the way, is the way it is today is because of the things that happened during Paul's tenure and after Paul's tenure and before Paul's tenure on how we got here, and it was by design. Listen, uh, my plan calls for doing the work to make sure we have a library and a social worker and a nurse in every single school, making sure we can inc increase uh, enrollment and increase graduation rate, having a pathway to career technical education so our young people can have jobs and the trades and, and vocations when they leave school. I talk about making sure that we get the 40, $436 million that Springfield has shorted um, the system, as well as working on the evidence-based funding model and uh, readjusting Springfield's current tier system to make sure that we can get the money that we need. Uh, it also talks about working with our young people who are unhoused and making sure that we are a complete school district. But listen, we have to stop the corporatization and the privatization of CPS. I have legislation today in Springfield that makes sure that the next superintendent of CPS is actually a superintendent and not a CEO. This is not a business. This is an education system. Unfortunately, in 1995, the Republican legislature changed the, the law so that Paul, who was unqualified to be a superintendent, could actually run the school system. Let's stop treating our babies like commodities and give them the respect that they deserve. Thank you, Representative Alderwoman King. I definitely agree with that as an educator myself. Um, listen, if we don't have safety and good schools, people are going to continue to leave Chicago and not come to Chicago, so we have to get to this issue. As a former educator who helped start a thriving small school in the North Kenwood, Oakland uh, community, I know exactly how to do that. We have a plan uh, to bring more selective enrollment schools with a neighborhood component to all our communities. We have Kenwood in my ward right now that has a seventh and eighth grade selective enrollment program that feeds into its high school, which is all a neighborhood uh, component, and it has test scores like Jones, also in my ward, that is purely a selective enrollment school. So we have to bring resources to schools like that all over the community so that we can build our school. We also have to incentivize teachers. Teachers and police are leaving our city faster than we can hire them. There are two professions where we throw everything at them that we are unable to solve, and that is Police and teachers, we have to incentivize our teachers to stay here. I would do that by giving them uh, low interest uh, or no interest uh, mortgages, uh, incentives for down payment on housing, different things like that to make sure that they are here. We also have to make sure that our kids are engaged. There's no reason why K through 12, we can't have robust after school programming. That's a failure of our school system right now. And bringing back trades to the schools in a meaningful way is something that we need to do and leverage the fifth floor to do that. Right. Not wait till the kids are 18 uh, and after they're disengaged to get into an apprentice program, but bring those back to the school so we, that we can prepare our kids for the jobs of the future. Thank you, Alderwoman. Thank okay, you. So uh, I want to switch to funding. In, in, another major issue that came up on our, our survey uh, facing CPS is that looming budget deficit. Mayor Life, but you've transferred some of the CPS costs from the city budget onto CPS directly, including costs of crossing guards, school police officers, and you've asked CPS to contribute $60 million to pension costs. So a question here from Walter and Dunning. Explain specifically how the CPS budget can be reconfigured to put more funds in the classroom. Well, uh, what I think it's important to know is that um, roughly 90% of the funding that goes to CPS actually goes into the classroom. Mr. Vallis has repeatedly said only 60%, but if you actually look at a, a reader's a citizen's guide, resident's guide to CPS, you see that 90% actually goes into the classroom. I know you don't like that fact, but it's, that's the reality. L let me go back, though, to the earlier question, which is population loss. Many of the factors that have led to the loss of students in CPS are not controlled by CPS. The population loss in particular under, um, uh, on the south and west sides with the closure of the 50 schools, uh, but also the fact that we haven't provided sufficient economic development and investment in those areas, which is why things like Invest Southwest, why our three, $300 million plus um, Chicago Recover Grants are important. We've got to build back vibrancy in those communities, and when we do, we see 
people come back to those communities and those schools will be uh, repopulated. But first and foremost, we also gotta work with the community. We have areas of our city, like some on the, the far north side, that they're um, overrunning. The elementary schools are super crowded. We have other areas of our city where there's not enough population. How do we balance that? We start with listening to the parents. Here's the other thing that we must do. We must keep our schools open. I am going to continue to fight and resist any effort to close down our schools uh, because we know that where our students learn best, where they're safest, is in person in schools, and we will continue uh, to fight right. uh, for that. Finding students was another issue. We have done that, and how have we done that? By going and working with the building uh, principals, um, identifying those families that are most vulnerable, that are most at risk, that haven't come back. We lost contact during remote learning with about 100,000 kids. They're back as of the fall of 2021. You, so right. those are the, some of the specific things that we were Well, time doing. to move on to our final round, which is the lightning round. Uh, we got a ton of questions from voters on all kinds of issues. So we're just gonna go down the, the line here, and, and candidates, your job here is simply, simply to answer yes, no, or maybe. Again, yes, no, or maybe. All right, so first question is on housing. Uh, Temi from the Tri-Taylor area asks, do you support repealing the state ban on rent control? Congressman. Maybe. <laughs> Mayor Lightfoot. No. Paul Vallis. No. Cam Buckner. Yes, no, or maybe. Pick one. No, maybe. I think we've got to think through it. Alderwoman. No. Brendan from Lakeview wants to know, will you end or change the speed camera policy <laughs> that fines drivers who go six miles above the speed limit? Alderwoman. That's a maybe, because it's a false narrative. We, we, we could have equity. <laughs> we could raise, uh, we could lower the threshold All right. after we, we got redistribute maybe. the cameras. It was a false fight that the mayor put us in. Representative really Buckner. We need safe streets and infrastructure, <laughs> maybe. Paul Vallis. Yes. Mayor Lightfoot. Um, no. At a time when we're seeing all these deaths and traffic fatalities, this is not the time to let people drive faster around parks or schools, and I will continue to resist that. All right. Is it about ticketing? No. The question, the question is, will you end or change the speed camera policy that finds drivers who go six miles above the speed limit? Yes, no, or maybe? No. Alec from Uptown asks, do you support a protected bike grid across the entire city, even if it will remove some street parking spots? Paul Vallis. Yes. Cam Buckner. Absolutely. Sophia King. Yes. Mayor Lightfoot. We're doing it now, yes. Yes, yes. Uh, Congressman Garcia. Yes. All right, here's a question from Ivy in the Woodlawn area. Do you support an amnesty program for Chicagoans who are getting overcharged on water bills by the city because they can't get a water meter? Alderwoman King. Yes. Yes. Water to human rights. Paul Vallis. Yes. Mayor. I'm sorry, can you re repeat the question? Sure, once? absolutely. Uh, do you support an amnesty program for Chicagoans who are getting overcharged on water bills by the city because they can't get a water meter? Um, the, the answer is yes, um, but um, we have uh, provided people a way to get back right. uh, with their water bills. We've actually so we um, heard encouraged yes. people to uh, get water meters. So and the answer Congressman is yes. Garcia. Yes. <laughs> All right, final question here, perhaps the most interesting that we got from our survey. John in Rogers Park simply wants to know, do you believe in ghosts? Alderwoman. <laughs> yes, no, or maybe? No. <laughs> Ghost bust, um, unfortunately, yeah. Cam Buckner, yes. Okay, Paul Vallis? Yes. <laughs> Mayor? I believe in spirits from the material world, yes. That's a yes. Okay, and Congressman Garcia? Sometimes. <laughs> All right, we will have to leave it there. Thank you to everyone who Thank participated in our us. People's Agenda survey that informed this forum. Our thanks to all the candidates who took part today. We've been speaking with Chicago Alderwoman Sophia King, Illinois State Rep Cam Buckner, former CPS CEO Paul Vallis, Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot, and Congressman Chewy Garcia. Tomorrow at 11, we'll bring you our second forum with the four remaining candidates running for the city's top office. Tune in and watch that as well. In the meantime, stay with us. After a short news break, we're gonna tap in with a panel of experts to analyze what we just heard from the candidates and keep the conversation going. Much more Risa to come, but first back to Lisa Lavis. Thank you, Sasha. It is 11.50.